With Copa America and the Euros igniting the soccer world, we have Roger Bennett on to talk us through those major tournaments and some new data on the American soccer fan. Plus, a new golf league received a major investment before it has even begun play, and the Marlins aren't always easy to watch, but for two months they will be free to watch. It's Tuesday, June 25th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The star-studded league received a major investment to expand into new formats, territories, and media properties. Then again, for this particular company, everything is new because it hasn't launched yet. Tomorrow Sports, which was founded by Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy, closed a funding round led by Dynasty Equity Partners and Connect Ventures, which values Tomorrow at around $500 million per Bloomberg. Any estimates of Tomorrow's worth involve more guesswork than most private company valuations because the company's flagship indoor golf league, TGL, was supposed to begin last January, but the launch was postponed by a year due to damage to its venue. TGL will take place in a customized dome, which partially deflated due to a power failure in November. That said, the new investors can look to tomorrow's partnership with the PGA Tour and his broadcast deal with ESPN as signs that the league should have a high floor. In addition to its two co-founders, TGL has Justin Thomas, Colin Morikawa, Ricky Fowler, and plenty of other big names in the sport. While TGL and Tomorrow seem to be separate from the negotiations between the PGA Tour and Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, they could prove useful in strengthening the tour's position as it seeks to retain its grasp on the future of golf. The Miami Marlins are not having a good year. They have one of the worst records in baseball. They traded their best hitter just over a month into the season because things were already looking grim. Their average game attendance is second lowest in the league, and they currently don't have a single player in the top five at any position in the National League All-Star voting. To make matters worse, a carriage dispute between Comcast and Diamond Sports Group has made it impossible for many local fans who still want to watch this team to actually do so. For that last issue, the Marlins have actually stepped up to offer a solution. The team is covering the cost for any South Florida fans to sign up for two months of Bally Sports Plus, which will allow fans to watch their games. From there, they are presumably hoping that the carriage dispute will have resolved or that fans stay subscribed. Marlins fans should be warned that by the time those two months have passed, the trade deadline will also have come and gone, and this team may be less recognizable than it currently is. And ESPN is taking a page from its parent company, Disney, with a new offering for MLB fans. The network is offering a five-day multi-city tour around Labor Day weekend, which will include catching games in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, tours of the Jackie Robinson Museum and ESPN headquarters, hotels, transportation, meals, and time with ESPN broadcasters and analysts, such as Buster Olney, David Cohn, Michael Kay, and Doug Glanville. All of that will set you back between $7,000 and $8,500, which is more than the large majority of season ticket offerings out there. All right, I'm thrilled to be joined once again by the founder of the Men and Blazers Media Network, Roger Bennett. Welcome, Raj. Oh, Owen, it is a joy to be back. Uh, great to have you. So um, let's start with Copa America. You know, it's one of the biggest tournaments in the four-year international football calendar also kind of a dry run for the 2026 world cup which is happening in many of the same venues it's early still only you know a handful of games in but what are your initial thoughts on the tournament we are living in incredible days for all who love football and its rise in the united states of america we're living a summer of europa copa uh, by day um, we have uh, the Euros uh, raging in Germany, um, just delirious feast of football. Uh, the opening round has given us football from 9 a.m. Eastern time uh, until 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. And then the Copa America, which is being held across this nation, South America's finest teams uh, playing uh, some invitees, including the United States, Canada, uh, and Jamaica from our region. Uh, and that goes on until 11 o'clock. So it is almost um, you know, 12, uh, more than 12 straight hours of football. Um, I came here just before the World Cup 1994, uh, where you couldn't get football of any kind on television. It's now broadcast um, day and night to just sizable audiences packing out NFL Stadia to watch Messi, to watch Brazil, to watch the United States. And I think we're just finding out, Owen, how much Alexi Lalas is too much Alexi Lalas because <laughs> dude, dude's putting in a shift. <laughs> he sure is. Um, the Copa's always been kind of the, the South America Euros. It's it's always been dominated by 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 those countries. Um, 
How far does the U.S. have to get here to feel good about this tournament this year? Well, the United States is in a remarkable uh, period of time. We have the deepest talent of young players that we've ever had for the first time ever um, in the run-up to this. The United States fielded a team uh, where from front to back, all 11 players were playing in the top five leagues in Europe, uh, which is a remarkable achievement. We used to celebrate when one of our stars uh, played for some random uh, team in Belgium. Now they're you know all over the Premier League. They're playing uh, in the top teams in Italy. Uh, not just uh, alone. There's you know, the AC Milan have Christian Pulisic um, and Yunus Musa, another fine young midfielder. Juventus, the vaunted Juventus, have Weston McKinney uh, and Tim Weah. They're playing in in in, in couplets. Um, so this is a deeply talented team. Um, but what it hasn't done. Uh, in modern history is go into a tournament, face a true powerhouse nation um, in, uh, in in knockout rounds of a tournament, look them in the eye and just go to toe to toe and emerge victorious. The one win we've had um, in serious tournament play outside of our own region uh, came in the World Cup. We beat Mexico um, in the round of 16. So, what this team now has to do is to prove itself to itself and prove itself to the rest of the world is, it, uh, my Lord, it would be a disaster if it didn't get out of the group stage. But once it's in the clear open water uh, of the knockout stages, uh, look a Brazil, look a Colombia uh, in the eye. Those are the two teams we're most likely to play uh, in the in the round of 60, in the quarterfinals and, and just, not just give them a great game, not just have a moral victory, but have a victory victory uh, and really announce it to the world. It's time. It occurs to me that this U.S. team, I mean, um, I I'm wondering if, if there's just sort of kind of a diversity of styles and, you know, places they've trained, places they play that you might not see for, you know, the, the French team, the, the U.K. team, um, because the, the U.S. is still kind of finding its footing as a soccer nation. I mean, maybe that's not quite fair, but um, because, you know, you're, you're happy to kind of play in, in any, any country that'll have you. Um, uh, I'm wondering if it leads to kind of a diversity of styles, but also kind of a lack of cohesiveness around the team. Look, th those days are long gone when, you know, in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, American players, if they were given the time of day at all, they were just seen as good citizens, athletic uh, guys who were good in the locker room didn't cause too much trouble. And there's a whole generation of young talents. Um, Christian Pulisic is the, definitely the one best known to your um, to your audience. Just a, a, out of Hershey, Pennsylvania, a young wonder, just had the season of his life at AC Milan um, in Italy, scoring, creating, hurting teams, often at will. Um, and we have a Tyler Adams, uh, who's coming back from injury, he has a show on our network, uh, the captain uh, presented by Allstate. Um, he is a, he's a one man collective fist capable of uh, biblically smiting opponents. I mean, just a, a, the kind of guy that lifts the whole team up, not just with his own play, but uh, has a collective effect. Um, you know, Gio Reyna, uh, a young um, creator um, who is, you know, his career had bright heat spotlight and has faltered of late, but I have no doubt he will uh, find his footing and surge again. There's creators, human beings who who have the ability to, to score um, at will. There is no doubt we have the talent, but international football is, a, it is, is an odd beast. It's not like club football uh, where the players play every day together and train together. These teams are, are fleeting creatures, almost like all-star teams that come together, train once or twice, and then take the field. Um, and this United States team, plays most of its game in our region where we're playing the Mexicos who are generationally bad, where we're playing you know, Jamaica's Trinidad and Tobago, um, uh, Panama, Costa Rica. And it's a bit like being a football team. Um, it's been like being Gonzaga, to be honest, where you uh, play in a conference where you routinely beat everybody quite easily. And then once you get into March Madness, you really only then find out what weight class you are. Or like the Dallas Cowboys emerging uh, every year from their 
their division and, and getting clipped in the knockout rounds. Um, we need more competition. We need more competition against great teams uh, to really find out exactly what weight class we're in. And I think there's a gulf between the hopes and the dreams of the fan base who've been dreaming of this team being what we know they can be really since 1990 when they returned to World Cup play and the current reality. And I hope the Copa can change this. And speaking of that fan base, uh, Man and Blazers conducted a survey of its American American fans, American readers. And um, so you found a, a whole bunch of things. Uh, uh, let's start with just who the American fan is. It's sort of a, a different animal from a typical European soccer fan. Absolutely. We did this study with YouGov um, because we wanted to find out what makes the American soccer fan truly unique. It's of 9,000 American football, American soccer fans. Uh, we wanted to try and understand, though, in the contours of their passion, which leagues they love, which teams they prefer, how much Messi's arrival has shaken fandom up, how much Christian Pulisic's move to Milan drew eyeballs to Italian football. How much women's football fandom is growing, which it really is surging more and more and more. So we partnered with, with YouGov, who is a leading consumer intelligence company uh, in the United States. And we did this survey uh, from C to Shining FC, which is available on Men in Blazers website. Um, and ultimately, when we started covering football, summer of 2010, this sport felt like a bit like being Captain Kirk on the uh, uh, on the bridge of the USS M Enterprise. Um, the, the US had been stubbornly resistant to football's lure. America was still the final frontier for the world's game, um, and that's changed dramatically. You can, uh, you are. There are the, number one. There's truly madly deeply fan base. It's very young. 18 to 30, um, but they are utterly, utterly devoted to the game of football as close to Chelsea uh, from Chicago as if they lived uh, in a stone's throw away from the home stadium, Stanford Bridge, Liverpool from Los Angeles as if um, they went to the, the match at Anfield every week. That audience is there, um, but it is different, profoundly different um, uh, to the English fandom that I grew up with. Uh, so I'll just throw out two examples. The first is um, that they don't just support one team. Uh, I think 43% support three teams or more, which is remarkable. Um, you know, ultimately, um, when I grew up, if you grew up in um, in Liverpool, you support the team that your, your grandparents supported, handed down to you biblically, a bit like lactose intolerance. It's baked into your DNA. And it's determined by geographic constraints. Um, here, we're choosing freely. We can choose any team anywhere in the world. There aren't those geographical or that multi-generational following. They're all across the ocean anyway. So. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, and so the American fan often takes the schema that they do for their American fandom, where if you live in Chicago, you support the Bears, the White Sox, uh, the Blackhawks, the Bulls, multiple teams. And so American fans, we're right now at Men in Blazers Media Network, we're on a national tour going city to city um, across America to celebrate the Euros and the Copa. Um, and afterwards, when I'm having a beer with an audience, uh, with the audience, I'll always say, what teams do you support? And the American fan will say, you know, I support Everton in the Premier League, Dortmund and my German club. I support AC Milan now, politics there. I love Wrexham and I love the Washington spirit, the women's team. Um, and so there's this multiple, almost a, um, a polygamy uh, of fandom, which is remarkable. And the other profound way that they are different is that 12% have changed the team they support in the last five years, which means, you know, if a team changes, if a team uh, have new owners that uh, kind of have forgotten the DNA of the club, if they get relegated, move down from the majors to the equivalent of AAA, um, you know, in England, you stay with your team. There's that old adage, you can change your haircut, you can change your home, you can change your partner, but you can never, ever change your football team. In America, um, you know, if for whatever reason that team stops emotionally speaking to you, the American fan, 12% of them have changed in the past five years, uh, finds another main focus of their, their emotional bandwidth. And so the teams, even when they have um, the fan, 
have to keep storytelling in deeply connective ways or risk losing them. Not only do American fans, you know, drop teams, pick up new ones, but it's not just who's who's the winner. It's kind of the ones that they, they glom onto. You know, it's sort of like it's 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 like reality television in a way that some sports aren't if you grew up with that sport. You you're just you're with your team, you you feel it, um or they're in your blood whereas this is just more it's it's entertainment it's further away uh you're it's, it's a new thing for a lot of fans and so oh yeah they can they can you know find these bit characters that they're more interested in than you know than the, the alpha males i mean I, d- I don't want to demean it at all because i've i live it and it is rich and it is deep and it is truly madly deeply um i mean the the percentages are are remarkable of of, of human beings um uh, under the age of 30, I think 87% indicated that football was one of their, quote, top interests, which anecdotally is somewhere between buying a jersey every year and getting a tattoo, a Tottenham Hotspur tattoo on your forearm, that the fandom burns deeply brightly. The statistic that shows us this, and to be honest, this was off the charts and is remarkable, 28% of respondees said they will go to a Premier League game for the team they support every single year like a pilgrimage. It's not just a fandom that's quasi-interesting. It is a fandom that is deeply embedded in their uh, financial priorities, that pilgrimage, that annual pilgrimage. Uh, you know, Not just moving to action, but investing considerable money in that fandom. There is a depth there. Um, but, you know, in this fluid, tectonic shifting world of football where a new owner can come in and take a team that stands for one thing and completely pivot uh, destroy it like a cheese souffle collapsing in the oven. Um, you know the, the the English fan is stuck with that team. Um, you can see that the fans uh, often organising against their own uh, owners. Many American fans will just emotionally move, change, disconnect, and find themselves tuning in to watch. You know, are the, the the teams that came out biggest, uh, most supported? Your Arsenal's, your Liverpool's, uh, your Tottenham's teams that had some combination of deep, deep history, a rich history and authentic um, telling um, the the possibility of winning. It feels like Americans choosing with fresh eyes don't just want to jump on the bandwagon, but they'd like to support a team that has a chance of winning. Um, but they're also picking teams that have strategically made the United States audience a priority for their own storytelling. Tottenham Hotspur, for instance, made the United States audience a number one strategic priority, and it's really, really paid off. Whereas other teams uh, who lack the authenticity, lack that winning, lack that chance of winning, um, in some ways that are surprising, like Manchester United, who are a global giant, a global gold standard, but who haven't been an aspir- have been nothing but kind of a grey gardens while Americans have been watching since 2014 when NBC started to broadcast the thing, actually underperform in a way that that was also startling. Yeah, and Man City also is, you know, it, they've, they've just been dominating since many American fans have tuned in. It makes me think of, you know, when I've traveled overseas, oh, often you, you meet Yankees fans a lot of the time just because, you know, like, why are you a Yankees fan? Well, it's like, it's the team I know about. It's like they... At least they used to win a lot, and uh, and also they're they're just kind of everywhere. It's like if you know a baseball team, it's the Yankees. I feel like if you know of a Premier League team in the U.S., yeah, it's probably Man City, Man United, and maybe Arsenal. It's just interesting that the Manchester teams are underperforming. Well, teams, I mean, as you I guess would expect, Wrexham overperforms Everton, which I think you have uh, no small part in. Um, also overperforms um, among American fans. It's that, um, you know, it, it's funny. It's a, it's a narrative uh, more than a, a bandwagon, or at least the narrative has as at least as much as a part of play that. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Wrexham story is remarkable. Um, you know, we did a story uh, that shows that the power, of, one of the findings was the power of storytelling outstrips the actual quality of the football. And so American fans are falling for English lower league teams, almost as if they're indie bands. Um, you know, the Wrexham story is now well known, um, but it's w- what it's done is is open the eyes um, of an American fan base, which is actually slightly older than the Premier League fan base um, and, and has woken up a true hunger um, 
for football outside of an audience who are already connected to it. So what Wrexham have done is very singular, but they've shown that there's a true hunger for storytelling about players, about towns, about characters, the traditions, the pies, and the human wonder of what's perceived to be um, authentic football uh, that can really be uh, that can really be lent into by a lot of these American owners who are moving over there. And will also be a challenge for MLS. Another of our findings, we go into depth about the growth of the MLS, how Messi uh, has made Inter uh, Miami bigger than the entire league itself. Um, but the, the MLS is also threatened uh, by the juggernaut that is the English Premier League and the Champions League on home turf, um, as well as the growth of NWSL, the National Women's Soccer League, which has been an immense story, one of the most joyous of my football fan life, watching that league um, grow and grow and grow. In some ways, NWSL is in a better position or they don't really have to compete in the same way with the Premier League. I, of course, there's there's the Women's Premier League as well. Um, but I feel like the NWSL, is. it feels like it's just as good. It's just as celebrated. The stars are just as big as they are in Europe. Whereas MLS, you know, when we get messy, it's, you know, it's like this angel from the heavens has, has arrived. The action is across the pond. He's better than an angel. I don't want to, I don't want to diminish his greatness. Um, I mean, he is remarkable. His effect has been, has been enormous. Uh, but w- there are a number of findings on women's football, which are really fascinating and eye-opening. We've got to remember N- NWSL is so new as well and is surging um, to such an extent um, off the growth of football and also the growth of women's uh, interest in women's sports too connected but separate uh, waves. And what we found in terms of women's football, uh, it's the ninth finding in the report, um, is that when it comes to the women's game, supporters are fans more often of specific players first and then the team second. Uh, you know, a talented player with an engaging personality, uh, incredible skills, a compelling story is often the way in uh, to the particular club, uh, which you, Gov, um, have looked at um, and understand and go in depth in the report um, that it's very, very common um, in the infancy of a league uh, for that phenomenon, even for one that's growing as fast as the National Women's Soccer League is, um, for that to be the case. But my Lord, that women's story, uh, you know, we've just started a division, uh, Men in Blazers, the women's game, um, solely to uh, focus on the narrative storytelling uh, around the women's side of the sport. The numbers are remarkable. The number of brands pouring in is remarkable. Uh, I think it's going to be the decade uh, sell to come. We've come this far. I haven't even given you a Euros question. So before we go, um, just, who, who's got the, the most uh, at stake here in the Euros, if that's a fair question? Most at stake? Um, so the Euros is the, the greatest teams in the continent of Europe. It's probably pound for pound um, the hardest tournament to uh, to progress in once the knockout rounds begin. Um, we are we're still we're coming to the end of the group stage. Uh, we've seen the host nation Germany burn bright, and then uh, and then and then have a humbling um, uh, in their in, in their final group game. Spain uh, playing delirious football. Really, the story of the tournament has been international football is often very conservative because the teams are fleeting creatures who are flung together. They most often play defensive football, just try and hold on, nick a goal um, and progress uh, in that style. But the football has been hilariously buccaneering and attacking, almost drunk. Just uh, the goals have all been just unbelievable bangers, just remarkable uh, moments of, um, of kind of, uh, Caitlin Clark range shooting uh, or own goals, just slapstick moments of self immolation and nothing in between. So it's been dizzying. Story of the first round has really been the rise of Eastern Europe, the teams where often through quite dark forces, a, an autocrat has decided football is a way to announce the team to the world. Uh, you know, happened in Turkey, happened in Hungary. Uh, and we're seeing in places like Albania that investment really coming off and every team just pound for pound uh, pugnacious. Um, Spain have been delirious. Um, Germany have been quite magic. France uh, with Mbappe, that uh, remarkable human being, are yet to find their true rhythm. Um, but the story is ever most at stake, most pressure. Always, it's always England where the jersey 
weighs as heavy as as chain mail, where the men's side have won nothing in 58 years, where the fan base love two things, either their team winning or destroying their team. Um, and they seem to be tilting towards the second. And it's like rubbernecking, watching it. Thank God I cheer for America now, because watching that team uh, be braced to be torn down by its own fans again, uh, humanly, is hard to watch. But at the same time, Owen, you can't take your eyes off it. Raj, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank, thanks for having me. You can get that report at the Men in Blazers website on meninblazers.com. Owen, it's great to be with you. Big love, courage. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, drop us a rating and a review wherever you get your podcasts or throw us a like and comment on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.